Hey everyone, back again. We're going to continue on with Jack Halberstam's In a Queer Place and Time. Today we're just going to be looking at chapter 5, just the way that it's unfolded for me, uh, titled Technotopias, representing transgender bodies in contemporary art. And then next time, part 4, we'll take on chapters uh, 6 and 7 to close off the text. And yes, yeah, so you know me. If you're just tuning into this, go check out parts 1 and 2. Go check out all my more than 300 episodes I already have up. Chances are there's going to be something else there that you like. If you subscribe, you'll be able to see videos I release every single week on YouTube or whatever you can do on a podcast platform like follow. I assume that's what you do with a podcast platform. And you'll be notified every single week when I release a, a, an episode, sometimes twice a week, which is cool. And then you'll never miss anything. We'll all add to our already vast knowledge uh, together. We will grow together. But yeah, let's jump into here, chapter five. Now, I'm confronted with an issue here as somebody telling you this over a podcast, because this chapter is all about visual art. And so I'm not going to be able to talk about every single work of art and unpack it in the way that Haberstam does, because I don't have the added benefit of using visual aids. Now, with that being said, I'm still going to talk about some pieces, and I'd really highly recommend you Google them so that you have, or just look them up, uh, so that you know what I'm referring to. I'm going to try to be as descriptive as I can so that it's not necessary for you to go and look this stuff up. But in any case, I need to be totally forthcoming in that I am committing something of a violence to this text in my picking and choosing the things that I talk about, because Halberstam goes through many different examples, and I don't have the time uh, to do that here it would take a very long time just to present each of these works of art and unpack them in the way that Haberstam does and also it's I don't have the ability being a podcast you're just listening to me so I just want you to know that I'm aware of that and the best way to get around it is to just read the chapter read the whole book on your own like that would be really be the best way for you to to learn about this stuff and to really increase your knowledge about what Haberstam is writing about so a technotopia very cool word. Here it refers to the spatial dimensions of this aesthetic, its preoccupation with the body as a site created through technological and aesthetic innovation. It captures the non-logical self. And this resonates with the point from the previous episode we've done from the previous chapter, where Haberstam was focused on postmodern cinema in the late 20th century and trans cinema, and looking at examples of The Terminator, and The Matrix, where these are films about the merging of technology and human life and bodies. So this chapter is going to look at that, but in visual art, but like not literally only examples of machines and bodies coming into contact with one another, but also just like presenting bodies that don't adhere to a standardized norm. So presenting not just thin bodies, that are e all smooth and uh, easily framed in a, on a cadre, like on a in your in your frame. It's like you know presenting bodies that deviate from the norm, and how the connection with technology in some cases demonstrates the possibility afforded by these technologies in permitting people to change their look to the way that makes the most sense to them and doing other things. So as public awareness about trans people and trans identities elevated, uh, so too has the prevalence of visual art of trans people been elevating, where there's a, a growing body of trans artists who are actually contributing to public discourse in a way that has been more accepted. Like they've always been contributing, but that in a way that was being more uh, respected and more accepted within the broader art community. However, this art often skips over, uh, skips over representing trans people and instead focuses on transsexual bodies. So in this case, we see this distinction again between transgender people and transsexual people. So this art often skips over representing transgender people, like in their gender presentation, and instead focuses on transsexual bodies. So bodies that do not comply with the expectation imposed upon them from birth. So perhaps this is because the transgender body retains the marks of its own ambiguity and ambivalence. So this is why there's been a focus on the bodies 
instead of their gender presentation because this is like a site of fear. Like if the body is transforming, then this crumbles the entire edifice of heterose the heterosexual matrix we rely on. So one piece that captures this really well is J.A. Nichols's uh, In Another Place, which you, you should look up. It happens to also be the cover of some editions of this book uh, that imagines transgenderism in the form of a conglomerate creatures who emerge from the painting itself, where it depicts two hybrid bodies kind of standing on a street where they're clearly trans people, whatever that means, in that they are female presenting with like male facial features. And so we see these two people and it's done in a way where they're both standing on the street and they are both aligned with one another, yet not aligned, yet identifying similarly, yet not identifying similarly. And if, in case you didn't know, my, my understanding of art and art criticism and art theory is embarrassingly low. I, I am not well-versed in this stuff. So if, if I come off like someone who has no idea what they're talking about with art theory and how to view art, then that, that is very much the case. But so go look up this artwork in another place by J.A. Nichols. It's, it's brilliant. Like it's, it's amazing. I, I don't know why, because I don't have the language to explain art or to identifying, uh, to identify like what makes art beautiful. It really is though, uh, just because how it makes me feel. But anyways, so this chapter is going to look at postmodern visual art culture, not as a consequence of late capitalism, nor as a natural opposition to late capitalism, but as the generative clash between new modes of cultural production and late capitalism. So here Haberstam is not saying that it is just the product of capitalism, nor is it just created to oppose capitalism, but it's its own thing with its own history, with its own attachments, with its own, like the own community, its own communities that it fosters, it cultivates and, and creates. So unlike people like Jameson and Harvey mentioned in one of the previous episodes who think that postmodern art as a form of is just like a form of institutionalization, it's just a way to naturalize capitalist relations, it distracts people from the real problems in the world, they think that it is just like opposed to modernism that welcomes a revolutionary desire. So they put all their eggs in modernist art as a way to possibly resist capitalist exploitation and they see postmodern art as being like too focused on the local, on individual people's experiences. However, as Halberstam points out, uh, there's a moment in Jameson in the cultural logic of late capitalism when he meditates on the potentials afforded by postmodern architecture to open the door for new subjectivities and orientations. Now, Halberstam's like, well, why don't you extend this beyond architecture to just like art in general? and see this as a possibility for people to craft their own lines of flight in, in the world, to come up with their own identities, like in ways to, that make sense to them and just respecting those. So Halberstam wants to view trans art as a utopian technotopia or spati spatially an imag imaginative formulation of a body to open up possibilities for what it means to have a body to be human. So the postmodern interrogation of the subject, which is often just uh, a white cisgender hetero subject, the postmodern interrogation of this subject welcomes the creation of new bodies in an aesthetic realm that offers a way to begin adapting to life after the death of the subject. So the death, uh, death of the subject, perhaps a play on the death of the author in Foucault's words, or um, the Balt piece on that. But in any case, uh, or did I say Foucault? I mean, Death of the Author by Balt. Hold on, Balt. And then the What is an Author by Michel Foucault. I've, I've covered both of these texts if you're curious about them. Uh, but here, referring to the death of this subject, the subject being the death of that white hetero subject as being the universal, the person who feels like universal uh, or stands in for all the universal harms of capitalist oppression. And here we're seeing that people are actually affected by so many other things other than class-based oppression. So depicting trans people is not just to appropriate trans people's bodies. It is part of a long history of the representation of unstable 
unstable embodiment that may be read as anti-capitalist, subcultural, queer politics. So to illustrate this another way, Haberstam turns to Shirin Nashat's film, oh, it's, it's an art exposition or an art piece, art installation called Turbulent. And in it, there are two screens uh, where one is playing a man's musical performance in front of a crowded room, crowded like theater, and the other screen features a woman's performance where she's turned away from the crowd, saying nothing, but there's no one in her audience. She's just alone on stage. And Halberstam reads this as a transgender space because it conjures up a sight between two distinct genders. Like, as the viewer, you're caught between two. You're made to experience both the man's success and the woman's lack of success. And the commentary is that it has nothing to do with their talent, but just with the cultural appreciation of men over women. And this uh, Shirin Nashat is reflecting upon Iranian gender politics. And so that's reflecting those experiences. They're still relevant for everywhere else in the world. But in any case, it's really reflecting that. And it, so Halberstam suggests that this is a transgender space because the viewer is placed in between two genders, made to experience, see the world through the eyes of two different gendered people, where social conduct, religious doctrine, performance rituals, and cultural histories clash. There's this meeting of all of these different perspectives, all of these different influences here. And so there's this like welcoming of all of these different perspectives and identities, which is what Halberstam characterizes as the trans quality of this art installation. So then drawing upon Thomas Crowe's work, Halberstam argues that this and others are examples of the appropriation of the avant-garde art uh, and, and taking it away from the elite. So the avant-garde is not just something used in elitist circles by the wealthiest people to contemplate their own existence, but these are examples of efforts to recapture life from our administered and rationalized society. To use the avant-garde not just to confirm like aristocratic views or you know upper-class bourgeois sensibilities, but it is also to call attention to or to use that medium of avant-garde art to call attention to our administrated and highly rationalized society and to oppose its efforts at rationalization. So it's important to note that this focus in this chapter is not only on transgender art, art of and by trans people, or in either case, it is also about the ambiguous states of being that can be summarized as transgender. Now, like, this is also one of those moments in which there's, it seems like an implicit attachment between trans identities and ambiguity, trans identities and contradiction, trans identities and the uncertain, and attaching uh, transgressive significance to it by virtue of these attachments, which, like I said earlier, like, not all trans people are doing, are trans to be, to make a statement or to be political. They're just trans. That's it. Uh, so I, I always question this implicit attachment between the, um, I guess, the ambiguous and trans identity, or the uncertain and trans identity. So this chapter is going to look more specifically at a number of different artists, uh, including photographers and visual painters and other artists, including Jenny, Jenny Seville, Della LaGrace, Volcano, J.A. Nichols, and Linda Bessemer, who each contribute in some way to visual art production that captures these ambiguities, or captures ambiguities in any respect, and that therefore Halberstam clumps into the domain of trans art. So first, Halberstam considers Seville's painting Matrix, which features volcanoes, Volcano Della de Grace's volcanoes, nude body. And this artwork depicts a body with a vagina lowering over the viewer's position. And if you look at it, it's like the viewer is placed like sitting on the ground with a body towering over them. And it is, uh, the person has a vagina, but they also have a face with a beard and a masculine presenting face. And so in this image, in this work of art, what we see is this contradiction, this ambiguity at play as to the person's gender identity. So there's this, and there's this moment 
where Halberstam says that Volcano, who is the subject of the painting, Della La Grace Volcano, who is a trans man, was the subject of the painting, feared or worried that this image would take away from his maleness, like posing for it because he was, you know, identified with being masculine. And he worried after the fact that, you know, oh, well, maybe doing this would will mean that people won't respect me as a man. But Halberstam doesn't address this at all. Like, it's almost just like a passing comment. And I'm like, well, wait, wait, like, what, what was the end result here? Because this seems like a big deal, like, to then just use a trans person's body for a work of art that they don't consent to after the fact, like, then we shouldn't be showing this art, right? Like, because that's, that's committing a harm to this person. So I don't know what came of this. And I'm contributing to the problem, because I don't know. Uh, but I just want to put it out there that that's an issue here. And if anyone does know, I'd love to hear about it. So to get back into it, many of Seville's works, many of Seville's pieces, depict bodies that deviate from the norm, often the in between, in the in between stages, where Haberstam calls these the, the transgender stages of bodily alteration. She avoids sanitizing the body, and many of her works like feature people who with scarring where their bodies are deformed and mutated and I don't know how to read art at all like I said let alone art that's just so um just so charged uh, that I I just don't know how to do it but from Halberstam's perspectives Halberstam likens this to trans people pursuing body modifications without desiring sex reassignment thereby maintaining ambiguity so Seville's work doesn't try to produce bodies that are easily understandable and therefore could eventually be easily commodifiable. Seville resists all of that to produce bodies that are ambiguous and don't adhere to any standard hetero cisgender gaze. And Halberstam equates this with the process of maintaining ambiguity that is indicative of transgender subjects, which is, you know, you know, you know. And even to say that these people are pursuing body modifications without desiring sex reassignment is like still to commit to this distinction between, you know, transsexual versus transgender. You can do the body modifications, but if they aren't going to touch your genitalia or change your genitalia, then it's just, then you're a transgender person. Whereas if your genitalia is adjusted, then you're a transsexual person, maintaining this very firm distinction still between real bodies versus fake artificial gender. Now, Volcano, Della La Grace's Volcano, I'd definitely go check out Della La Grace's work. Uh, it's all, like, it's brilliant. Uh, but Volcano's photography is similar to Seville's work in that it explores the contours and erotics of what he calls sublime mutation by glorifying bodies and body parts that might otherwise be read as freakish or ugly. So for example, there's the piece called Transgenital Landscapes, which you should definitely check out. But these are pieces of like photography that present people undergoing bodily transformations or who exist in gendered ambiguous bodies which is always difficult terrain uh, but volcano treats the body here as a landscape that is open to this interpretation it's not as though there's any single unitary subject on the end that anyone is viewing rather it is someone who is always posing questions to the viewer this landscape is always posing questions to the viewer that questions their expectations in the act of seeing. How seeing itself is not just about receiving something that is exterior to you, but about placing your expectations onto somebody else or onto something to make something conform to your mind and to your experiences. So, you know, when people are confronting or when people confront these works of art, they will seek to try and rationalize it they will see a body that does not conform to their expectation of that body and they will pathologize it, you know, make it intelligible through 
uh, a kind of persecution by making it intelligible medically to say that, oh, this is someone suffering from XYZ issue, therefore uh, I can understand then the impetus behind this work of art, behind this person's choices, uh, which is one of the strategies in which viewing itself is an act of uh, capture. It is to capture people in a moment and to make them conform to your view. So Seville and Volcano depict bodies at the intersection of the human and the technological, with guns, scalpels, cars, paintbrushes that have marked hurt, changed, uh, imprinted, and brutally reconstructed those bodies. So people have done this before then. It's not like Seville and Volcano are doing completely new work in depicting people and bodies in this way, but they do so, and what's interesting for Halberstam and for myself is that there's this direct focus on trans people occupying this space. So there's so many other examples, like we mentioned before, Terminator, uh, The Matrix, Crash, like film before these examples of visual art, we're doing this. We're posing questions about humans' relationship with technology and what that does to humans, their connections with each other and their connections with themselves and their own bodies. But by bringing trans people into the fold reveals the extent to which that there is some possibility here in this you know, subgenre of visual art culture in these uh, art installations and in film that explores these ideas about bodily transformation, about transformation in general. So within even uh, art circles, one of the main influences was Eva Hess, whose work d largely disrupted artistic conventions. So she challenged artistic temporality. That it, So Hess's work, like if you check it out, like one of her art pieces is like these pieces of fabric that are degrading and they're just hanging up in, in a planned way and a planned pattern. And for Hess, uh, like the effort was to rethink what it meant for art to be produced and to th rethink our relationship to art. So she challenged artistic temporality. So we thought, you know, or we think that if someone produces a work of art, it has to stand the test of time. We have to protect it. You know, we have to keep it away from the elements, from degrading. She didn't want that. She thought an artwork should mutate, it should develop, it should change, it should age like a human almost. She challenged artistic permanence. She wanted her art to not be the same throughout its entire life, that it will degrade, it will change and take on an entirely new face. And she wanted to disrupt the idea of unitary figures by breaking the depicted object into fragmented parts. So many of her works include bodies that aren't like totalized or things that aren't totalized in themselves in the way that they're presented, but rather they're presented through their parts. Many of the parts are deconstructed and like look like glued together or uh, poorly attached together. And this signals that it's, it's going to be an art form that's going to disrupt your expectation. When you see a work of art, you will largely want to have something conform to your expectation, but this is going to disrupt that. So Hess's art, um, or Hess, I should have checked if it was Hesse or Hess, H-E-S-S-E, but you know how that can be pronounced sometimes. Uh, Hesse's art pioneered an exploration of gendered subjectivity as a set of dislocated experiences. So whenever we talk or try to really depict trans or queer identities, because there isn't already an entire archive to draw from throughout the course of like Western civilization, because trans and queer people have been repeatedly erased, from this history, then it always demands disrupting that history in the production of new trans and queer art uh, because it rubs up against everything that we know. And so in that way, this is why Halberstam can say that Hess's art pioneered an exploration of gendered subjectivity as a set of dislocated experiences. They don't lend themselves neatly to the clear temporal framework that white heterosexual cis people get to experience and so it needs to pursue different routes it needs to present the dislocated experiences instead of the located ones of the majority culture 
So Hess, among others, turned the often elitist avant-garde against the elite and appropriated it for queer subcultures. So, for example, there was another artist named Bessemer who made excessive use of color, almost like Impressionism, uh, that was often dissuaded for being feminine. And so there was a period in which, like, within art culture, like, using too much color would associate your work of art with being feminine. So there was this desire to maintain the masculine character by subduing the use of color. Now, Bessemer resists this. You use tons of color. And it was a way to reclaim what the avant-garde meant, to take it away from the clutches of white upper-class sensibilities and interests and to make it something for everyone to use it as a template to embrace these different possibilities in art now with all of these examples the transgender form becomes the most clear and compelling representation of our contemporary state of permanent dislocation challenging capitalism's rationalization and normalization so again it's important not to frame this as like a willing effort to transgress uh, capitalist exploitation because that is to ascribe too much intent behind being trans, being non-binary, being queer. So in this instead is just an acknowledgement of a potential that is separate from the primary objective of this art when these people are producing art to represent them and their culture. Like, that just makes sense. They aren't necessarily doing it to mount this political or economic challenge to capitalist exploitation. This is drawing upon one of the affordances of capitalist investment into various different industries that allowed for this burgeoning art scene to occur uh, while also criticizing and poking, posing problems to capitalism's self-interest, its desire to continually keep expanding and exploiting new markets, and so on. So it's neither a complete repudiation of capitalism, like capitalism, nor is it at all a celebration of it. it. Definitely veers more towards a critique while acknowledging these other forces at play that have historically, even before capitalism, limited the presentation of non-binary and queer people within Western culture. You know, I'm using that term very broadly from Western European culture into the North Americas, uh, really limited trans, queer, non-binary people's contributions to art and society. And yeah, that'll take us to the end here. It's just with the scheduling, with like how long it takes me, it just, I had to make this episode a little shorter, but next time we're going to take on chapters six and seven, and that'll be this text. We're going to talk about Austin Powers and the full Monty. You'll love it. But yeah, if there's anything I left out here, anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, you can like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a kick out of it. You can leave a review on some podcast platforms if you'd like. I love to read them. And yeah, on that note, take care.